Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m., is what I'm so used to saying every Friday morning. But once again, we are still recording live from a bedroom in my house as we are still under lockdown and quarantine here in the Houston area. Um, our guest today is Michelle Geelan, and she is actually a repeat guest. We don't have a lot of repeat guests on the show, but when we do, it's always somebody who brings uh, great information with them. Uh, and so uh, keep listening. Uh, Michelle has a lot of information to provide with us, to us. Um, lasting effects from the worst economic downturn in our lifetime are having a staggering effect on financial health. In fact, a recent survey from Frost Bank shows current financial health as a result of the pandemic is low with two and five, or that's 40% of Americans, citing their financial situation as fair or poor. So, Michelle Gielen, every time she comes on, we talk about optimism. So, well, I know that sounds a little bleak, but we'll do kind of a deep dive into that. And uh, uh, so keep listening, stay tuned. Uh, you know, if you are a longtime listener, we always reserve just the first few minutes of the show uh, to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston and the Gulf Coast area when it comes to financial literacy. Um, I know if you've heard this show, we all, we always talk about Houston Money Week, which takes place in April. Uh, and so why are we talking about this in August? Well, uh, as being part of the leadership team for Houston Money Week, we actually met last week to talk about Houston Money Week 2021. Uh, because as being uh, part of being a leader on the leadership team is it has completely changed. We've gone out and we've done financial literacy to large groups with our banking partners, our nonprofits, uh, our local city, state, and government. A lot of that took place in schools, uh, all, all the way from uh, elementary school to uh, the colleges, H uh, University of Houston, Houston Community College, City of Houston. Lots of representation there when it comes to, to financial literacy. And the one thing that has changed is we are now doing a lot of this stuff online. Uh, everybody's having to adapt and make changes. And so that was part, part of the purpose of that meeting this week was to kind of get in front of that, uh, change our thinking uh, about who we are talking to and whether it is just general financial literacy that we talked about in the past or uh, if people are in crisis mode right now and there are different needs that we need to, to meet with these seminars and workshops on financial literacy. So stay tuned. I just gave you kind of a cliff notes version of that, uh, but you'll hear me kind of update as we get closer and closer. Uh, that is, that's HoustonMoneyWeek.org. Uh, to find out more information about that as well. With that, uh, Michelle, I know you, but I want to introduce the, the listeners to you so that they can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you had a dream job at CBS News and you quit as an anchor of two national news programs. You were disturbed by the amount of negativity in the news. Uh, you didn't want a child walking through the room while she was doing her job, hearing her continually telling negative stories about the world. But her time at CBS News also sure showed her the incredible power that we have to create positive change by broadcasting a worldview that is more empowered, optimistic, and solution focused. Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's so good to be back. And I'm uh, so happy to hear about all the initiatives you have in the Houston area because right now I think we, we see more than ever before we really need all of that stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I mentioned a lot of stuff about you, but what can you tell listeners uh, that we don't know uh, about you uh, so that we can learn a little bit more about you? Well, uh, I am uh, living in Texas, so <laughs> I'm a neighbor of yours. I live uh, in Dallas. And oh, wow. I, yeah, um, and um, I'm also broadcasting from my bedroom right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, 
And since my time at CBS, which was during the Great Recession, which I had thought was the last economic downturn we'd hopefully see in our lifetime, um, I left there and I went to study at the University of Pennsylvania positive psychology because what I wanted to understand was how can we talk about these crisis moments in our lives in a way that doesn't leave us feeling depressed, depleted, stuck, uh, paralyzed, basically, and instead leaves us solution focused, empowered, rally to take action. Uh, we see the difference when our mindset is in the latter state versus the former in the outcomes that we can create. And so, and there's a science behind it. So for the past decade or so, I've been studying optimism and, and happiness, the scientific study of happiness, which has been amazing. And, uh, and what, and then how we as individuals, as uh, parents, as business leaders, how we can leverage that research to fuel every aspect of our lives to improve our performance, our productivity, our business profitability. And um, we see a clear cut case that when we're in that state, we uh, can change every single measure dramatically. I love it. And I know you came on uh, before and we talked about the what's really kind of a manual for journalists or broadcasters like myself, uh, the broadcasting happiness, the science of igniting and sustaining positive change. So I would just kind of point listeners back. If you want to hear that past episode, you can go in there and look for it. But one of the things that we're kind of talking about today is this this study that came out by Frost Bank. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm so thankful to be partnered with Frost Bank. They have really been, uh, you know, thinking so um, in, in, along such important lines in terms of financial well-being and understanding how we can promote higher levels of well-being. Um, so what we did was we worked together to develop and field a study to explore how people are talking about money and in particular how optimism plays a role. The reason we wanted to look at that was previously we in a study that we talked about during the last episode, we looked at the connection between optimism and financial well-being. And one of the big headlines that came out of that study was that there was sort of this taboo around talking about money. Um, that's something that feels, you know, it, it feels like an intuitive result. You know, a lot of people don't feel really comfortable talking about money. What we wanted to understand was uh, more deeply why that's the case. And then our optimists behaving differently. Um, and we found, yes, that's the case. So um, people who discuss their finances, we found uh, are two times more likely to have better financial health. And they also experience a nine point higher financial well-being score. Nine points is significantly higher. We used a financial well-being metric that was developed by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So it's a very uh, widely adopted um, measure of of our total financial picture. Um, oftentimes when we start talking about studies like these, people say, oh, well, but if you're talking about optimism and money, then it must be all the, the rich people. They're feeling really good about everything. And so that's why you're getting these results. Um, what we wanted to do was, first of all, take a uh, um, you know, as we fielded the study, get a real cross section of America and uh, that was representative of the uh, of American population. Um, we also controlled for uh, things like, um, you know, wealth, income, skills, behaviors to level the playing field. For this particular study, we surveyed 200 Americans nationwide. And um, and what that allows us to do is to uh, compare, you know, apples to apples to really understand how an optimist versus a pessimist might think. Um, we found that of those people who are experiencing high levels of financial well-being, 100% of them are optimists. Optimists believe that conversations and talking about money can't hurt. And not only that, they actually seek out those conversations significantly more often than pessimists. So much so that pessimists are three times more likely to never discuss finances versus 94% of optimists discussing their finances, not only at some point, but most of the time they're doing this uh, regularly. Wow. Wow. So I, I I tend to fall into the category that I like to talk about. <laughs> uh, and. and <laughs> First thing that pops into my head is as a parent, there's kind of a fine balance because I'm I'm full disclosure. I want to share things with my child, but then you also don't want to, you know, get them too depressed when it comes to maybe bills or something like that. Uh, what what can you tell us about parenting and 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 how that plays a role in in discussing finances? 
Well, I think parenting, parents have this amazing opportunity to role model positive behaviors, whether it's with your money and discussing finances, or it's really in any realm. And so if your child is seeing that you're very open about money, you don't have to tell them, you know, exactly how much you make or what you spend, but just having those more open conversations about how we think about money, how we interact with money, how we, it's how important it is to to uh, save money and have that emergency fund, then they are more likely to later on in life feel comfortable to have those conversations. And, and that's actually one of the uh, behaviors that we found of optimists. They, um, they set up these regular conversations and they, uh, they are also very open to keeping it brief, right? You don't have to have a long conversation. You just have those short, regular financial conversations that you can actually, if you do it right, you can look forward to them because they give you an opportunity to check your progress as you are working towards your goals. Um, oh, and that's another thing that I thought it follows along a lot of the other optimism research in other areas of our lives optimists as they're talking about their money they get aspirational the majority of them have conversations that are goal oriented so i think as parents if we model that kind of those kinds of discussions our children will hopefully be more likely to follow suit as they uh, become adults i love that i love that there's a special place in my heart for where my 10 year old says huh isn't that expensive and i'm like i just smile because he's starting to think about that stuff at, at, at 10 years old as opposed to does money grow on trees and he doesn't know. <laughs> so, so <laughs> something good going on there um well let's so let's talk about there there's another so you mentioned a couple different things that was quite a bit of information that that these uh, that optimists seek out conversations about it they like to talk about it uh that we have opportunities as parents to be role models to uh, model that positive behavior uh, tend to keep it brief um, but let's kind of let's uh, talk about some of the existing barriers uh, when people don't have these conversations or when they don't fall in, uh, into the category of optimist um, what are some of the existing barriers that you see or maybe have seen in the study yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Well, right now, as you know, we're just seeing a really dire picture with the economy because we've seen, um, you know, this, and during the second quarter, we saw the most devastating three-month collapse on record with a 9.5% drop, drop in GDP. And uh, consumers are holding on to their money more than ever before. And, and it's understandable to be feeling stressed about finances, even if maybe you are able to maintain your job through this period of time. The thing is, for with a lot of the you know people in sort of my age bracket right now with young kids, that we might be able to keep our job, but we also have a second job that we're working, which is yeah, um, right. being a teacher or full, full, full time caregiver, right? So there's just right. so many reasons right now for added stress. Um, and then when you start to think about wanting to have conversations about your finances, that this might maybe not feel like the best time. Um, what we found with pessimists in particular, and just in general, is they feel as if conversations are unhelpful. As a matter of fact, they're seven times more likely to believe that nothing good will come out of talking about money versus optimists. Um, they also find conversations embarrassing. They feel they're more significantly more likely to experience feelings like um, feeling upset, dumb, ashamed, judged, guilty. And they also don't really feel like these conversations are very natural. Two times more likely to wait for the other person to start the financial conversation. Um, that goes back to what you were talking about earlier about modeling these conversations with your children. The more that we can help them feel that they're, these are natural parts of life uh, the, and feel comfortable having them, I think that the better off we are. But it's no wonder people's financial well-being right now is suffering um, just with everything going on and all, all the pressures and stresses that we're experiencing. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's it's it's important to put it put this into the context of what's going on right now. You gave some examples of, you know, we had this quarter, the economy's doing, you know, something that it hasn't quite done in a long time. Uh, and, and people are feeling stressed out about their finances and, uh, you know, even people that have jobs that haven't been laid off, they're having this second job as a, as a caregiver. They're having to take care of their, their kids while they're at home. <laughs> uh, so it, it yeah. is a lot, a lot of stuff. Uh, 
but then you also mentioned some of those behaviors that, that, that kind of fall into the wheelhouse of the pessimist that, that uh, people, they, they feel that those conversations aren't helpful. Uh, that, that it could be embarrassing or guilty or, or they feel kind of uh, uh, upset uh, when or they'll wait to, for somebody else to initiate the conversation. So uh, just pointing that out, that's a, that's a kind of a key thing there that, that you're talking about. Um, and that goes back to that taboo around talking about money. Um, while we still we've still got about 15 minutes or so in. Um, you know, I I think I want to say when you wrote when the you wrote uh, broadcasting happiness, that has that been in four four years? How long was that? Um, that was back in 2015, um, and it's just amazing to see how the research has become. I think even more important now. This is research yes. coming out of positive psychology and neuroscience, um, as we are right now as as a society, um, you know, struggling with big challenges and senses of uncertainty. Optimism, we find, is that it's a muscle. It's something you can build. Um, having, uh, you know, um, taking part in positive habits and practicing them, like the, some of the habits that we're talking about around financial conversations or practicing your gratitude, all of that builds that optimism muscle, and it helps us experience higher levels of resilience during all of these uncertain times. You know, I, I think that... Um, Finding people who kind of pull you towards a better version of yourself is, is extremely important. And I think finance is, is a perfect arena for that, um, to find those people that you trust, that you can connect with about something so important in your lives, your life. Um, for instance, if you're you know, looking to have those conversations around money, who is it that you really admire? Who is it that you really trust? Um, and if you don't have somebody, a friend or a family member that you would feel comfortable having these conversations with, you can also talk to a financial advisor. You know, I've been amazed by the depth of knowledge that uh, of, of Frost Advisors, for instance. And, you know, when I moved to Texas, I... <laughs> I didn't know anything about Frost. Um, I just saw these signs and, and it was so ironic because in the same shopping center around where I live in Dallas, there was a uh, Frost bank and then Frost ice cream store, <laughs> which just felt really funny, right? <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, maybe that's the other wing of it. But then as I got to know the the, the organization, I did it just it's such a, it's full of people with a beautiful spirit who really want to help. And I think when, to, so to be able to, whether it's at your bank or at Frost, to be able to tap into that depth of knowledge and those resources um, is, is really something to, to consider. Um, and so, and every time we take that step to, in whatever aspect of our lives, to make, um, to be aspirational and to make our dreams a reality and to, uh, you know, to have those conversations. I think we're strengthening our optimism muscle and ultimately fueling every aspect of our lives. As soon as this pandemic hit, the first thing that my husband and I did was we, in, well, we instituted Hogwarts Academy. So this is our attempt at being amazing teachers for our six-year-old son. And uh, so he was Professor Hufflepuff and I was Professor Gryffindor and we were bringing our son the magic of the world, um, along with the studies that he needed to do for kindergarten. And, um, but one, the cornerstone of the school that, uh, the school day was we made sure that we listed our gratitudes first thing in the morning with him. So each of us would go around and say three things that we were grateful for, and we would write it down. And then after the first week, we got in this habit of uh, looking at back at the list from the day before and picking out our favorite one, putting it on a piece of paper and putting it in a, a little glass bowl on the table, um, which became this visual reminder of all these amazing things that were happening in the midst of uncertainty and challenges and, and you know, the negative things that were happening out in the world. Um, and so I think, you know, I've had so many parents say to me, COVID has been this time of um, it's just, just extremely hard. And yet at the same point, it's brought out aspects of our family that has made me feel so much joy um, as we spend more time together. Um, so it's, it's not to say that there are not, there's not suffering going on in the world, but 
there's ways in which in the midst of these challenges that we can train our brain to be more resilient and see all that is, you know, is still working well in the world. I love it. I love it. So Hogwarts Academy, I have to tell my wife about that. It's, we are definitely <laughs> learning right now as, as we're trying to, t to teach there as well. Uh, so, so that was a lot of information there. I like the idea uh, I'm a very visual person, so the idea of when you guys sit down and you talk about gratitudes and things that you're grateful for and writing them down and then visually representing them by putting them in that bowl, it's kind of a way, a cue to remind us of, the, of those things that are there. Uh, you talked about Frost Bank. Frost Bank is also a partner with Houston Money Week, and so they've been uh, very active in, in our community as well. But you gave them as an example of the financial advisors, a banker, even if you have a family member or a friend, somebody that emulates those behaviors uh, that you respect, that you can ask questions uh, around the finances there. Uh, you talked about finding people help you bu build a better version of you. Uh, you talked about resilience, uh, building that muscle, that optimism, that optimism muscle and then just these positive habits and practicing them and how important this is with COVID going on and how you know there are there's a lot of suffering going on in the world but there all are these uh also these opportunities to see things in our family and our personal relationships that are uh uh that we might not have seen if we weren't looking uh so so this is a lot of really, really good stuff. We've got just uh, about seven more minutes before the, the end of the show here. Um, you know, one of the things that I continually go back to when I, that, that was the uh, uh, kind of how I was framing this was that it was five years ago that you put the book Broadcasting Happiness together. But what a time <laughs> for, for journalists <laughs> and, and, and a news cycle now here. So I know personally that this is one of the things that I go back to. Um, and, and you kind of based a lot of this stuff with, you know, the work of Martin Seligman and optimism. Uh, is there anything that you would, as far as the news cycle and for journalists that you would frame or change up with what's going on currently? Well, um, I think that right now the journalist job is more important than it's ever been because they are informing the American public and there is, there are very important stories happening right now. Uh, I think that with politics, there unfortunately is whether whatever side of the aisle you sit, so this is not a, <laughs> you know, a comment that hopefully will upset anyone, but I think there's unfortunately a lot of noise. There, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the stories don't necessarily contribute to a, a knowledge base that one needs to make smart, informed decisions, whether it's for our personal lives or for whom we vote for. Um, and so I, but with stories like COVID, for instance, it's very important to know what's happening, to know what's happening on a national and international level and with our local communities. But what's also equally important, I think, is not to get stuck reading too much and being too immersed in this information because it absolutely does affect our mindset and it can have a detrimental effect causing anxiety, causing stress, where uh, 10 minutes can get us informed, uh, you know, three hours is, is by far uh, too much. Um, so, you know, I had taken a, a news break after I worked at CBS for quite some time, and I thought it was really good. It kind of gave me this detox. And then after that, I decided that I was going to uh, figure out how to have a relationship with the news, but to do it in a way that doesn't leave me feeling depleted because I can't personally help solve every last problem in the world. I'm very solutions focused, and I want to be involved in solving issues or being, you know, being an engaged citizen. Um, so I, I think what I've settled on now, and I've had an, a great opportunity to practice it during the coronavirus coverage, is to find news organizations that have high quality reporting and become informed about the information and get, get the information that I need and then get out. And also, I don't read the news first thing in the morning because I think that it's more important to fill our mindset, with, our mind with um, positive things to kind of sort of buffer our brain against the, the negative that is sure to come when we 
become informed. The other piece of it is that I think it's really important to also expose our our brain to all the wonderful things that are simultaneously happening. The reason is that if we not only um, see that there's been a spike in cases in our local community, but there are uh, first of all, recoveries. There have been amazing stories of triumph thanks to our first responders and, and our medical professionals. Um, we see that some uh, local businesses are donating money to help support the food bank. When we also have our brain focus on that information, it gives us, it strengthens our belief that we have the ability to uh, influence the world around us. Optimism is defined as the expectation of good things to happen and the belief that our behavior matters. The more that we show our brain that our, our behavior and the behavior of others actually makes a difference in solving the world's challenges, the more it spurs positive action for us and helps us be a bright light for other people as well. I love it. I love it. Michelle, you have such a great way of, of framing that because uh, you started with talking about the uh, a, a very, it shouldn't be a controversial, a non-controversial statement that there is. <laughs> Lots of noise out there right now, and, and and I know personally, on as a financial advisor, I can reason that out and say when I look at finances, like oh, there's a, I have to discount a lot of it. It's noise, but I, I tend to go towards the politics stuff, and sometimes it seems like that volume's turned really, really high. So some of the things I need to remember <laughs> that you just reminded me about uh, that that uh, you know there are other positive things going on out there. Um, you know, if you're spending 10 minutes with the news, that's a, one thing. But if you're spending three hours down a rabbit hole uh, on a political yeah. thread there, that's probably not the, be the best thing. I, I like the idea that, of the buffer, uh, of kind of creating a buffer zone. So not reading the news right there in the morning. Uh, and if you do, you, you focus on some of those positive ideas. Uh, Wow, we are right here at the end of the show. We only got two minutes. Michelle, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to leave listeners with uh, before we go? I, I would just challenge everyone, going back to the original study that we talked about, to think about a financial conversation that you can have with someone that you know and trust. Um, and the reason is that maybe this is not actually going to be a financial conversation just for you. It might be for the other person as well, a massive benefit. So um, that would be my challenge to put this research into action. And I'd be curious to see where it takes everyone. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show. Uh, is there a website that we can point the listeners to to find out more information about the study? Yes, absolutely. And it has a wealth of resources. It's called optforoptimism.com. And it's, um, it, there is a 30 day challenge there. So if you really want to, you know, strengthen your optimism muscle, I encourage everyone to go look at it. It's phenomenal. It really puts the research into practice. Perfect. And if you're driving right now, we'll have that listed listed on the podcast notes as well, so you can grab it there. Michelle, thank you so much for uh, uh, sitting down and visiting with us once again. Oh, thanks for having me. Have a good one.